Hey everyone, Ashley Daniels here for a Spotlight On with actress, stand-up comedian, and writer Autumn Chickless talking about her new novel, Smothered. Tune in. You're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Yes. Happy birthday to your mama. Happy birthday, Mo. Happy birthday. Song, Cake by the Ocean. So I love it. Do you, so you said she has like a certain dance she does to this song, right? Oh yeah. So yeah. her and her friends every Monday night they get together to watch The Bachelor Bachelorette, <laughs> and when they play the song and they do the get down. The get down. Get down. They get on the tables and okay. then they get down. So. I I hope you are doing the get down right now. Uh, I am pretending like I am one of your friends doing it with you, <laughs> and you sound like the coolest person ever from the book. Um, and I am just so excited to learn about how this book got started and um, what inspired you, although I assume it has a lot to do with your amazing mama. Yes, so we'll it has get into so much it. to do with my amazing mama. <laughs> so first of all, I have to say, and truly, I know we were talking about this off the air, but I do want to mention it because I think it's really important for people to know um, that... Th this book in general, there's not a lot of books that I think can make you laugh from the gut. Like like the stomach, like the ab exercise pain that you have after, <laughs> after doing something. This was the laugh that I've needed for so long. Aww. And um, I don't want to make you cry because I know you were talking yeah. about it, but truly like, it's one of those books that you can't put down because nothing feels better than just laughing from the soul. Like just those those hysterical laughs that you just can't stop doing. And I, it's such a feel good book. You feel like you're part of the family. You're connected to the people in it. Um, I think even if you're not a millennial or a parent of a millennial, you can <laughs> still find a way to connect to these people because they're so authentic. And um, it makes a lot of sense because they are based off of you and your family who are very authentic, good people. So oh, goodness. I just want to say a just amazing book. Thank really. you so much. I mean, you have been so wonderful about it. it nothing means more to me than what you just said that is the best review I could possibly get oh god when I started writing this book I, I said two things is if it makes you laugh out loud and call your mom then I've succeeded um, oh I love that well it's you know it's meant to be a feel-good book and you know it's very satirical and it has its moment you know it has its moments of uh, dark humor but for the most part I really wanted to keep it light and fun so that when people read it from top to bottom it just made them feel good because I don't feel like we have enough of that in the world right now. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree and it felt like you were doing that as you wrote it. It just felt like that's what was behind it. It just has that essence of, of feel good. So anyway, Great. I want to get into for people that don't know what the book is about. It just came out August 7th mm -hmm. and people can purchase it on Amazon. It's I know it's Kindle. It's available on yes, audiobooks. Yes, Barnes & Noble. Yeah, everywhere. Your local bookstore. Yeah. Pretty much anywhere where books are sold, which is awesome. Yes, yes. And it's one of those things that I, see, I read the actual book, but um, doing audiobooks, I feel like this is one of those ones that you could listen to in the car and you'll just crack up the whole time. It'll make your ride go a lot faster. Okay, well, like I did the audiobook. You did the audiobook, okay? Yes. So it was that was a real interesting experience. I can imagine. It was the first time I read the whole thing front to back. Oh, is it really? Since I actually finished it. Oh wow. Um, and it was a year later. So that was a really interesting experience, having to start from the beginning and then out loud read every sentence. I went through a lot of crazy emotions while doing that. I can imagine. How long did it take to do the whole thing? The whole thing took about a year and three months. Wow. A year and three months, top to bottom, from blank page to Jeez. finished manuscript. Wow. Which, it, it was kind of a mad dash at a certain point, because I, uh, I sold, I was very fortunate, I sold the book a few months out of college, and then they gave me a deadline. And it's a good thing I had a deadline because I may have taken five years if I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't had a specific time that I had to finish. And st even now I reread it and go, oh, if I just had like one more day, I could have done this. But uh, it, was, um, it was a really kind of exhilarating and wild year to try to, you know, write my, my first book, my first long form story. Yeah, well, I'd like to get to how this inspired you to begin with, because you graduated USC, you um, were in theater, you had studied theater, correct? In, yeah, theater in and film. Film, so. right. So what inspired you to decide to write a book right after college? Well, it was, it was kind of this weird confluence of, you know, opportunity and luck and uh, my mom. So <laughs> basically, I was still in college. It was my, uh, my junior year of college, actually. When I first got the idea, because and I actually, um, I have it on my phone somewhere, I, I think I reposted it, I, I found the status that started it all, 
which was I, I wrote the status that said, you know, I've always said one day I'm going to write a novel about my mom. She's so funny. Here's a quote that she just told me about how, you know, parenting is so passe because we had just gotten a puppy. And some, make me a martini. Sometimes it's best to drink your calories. <laughs> and I wrote this and the response was overwhelming. People were liking it and sharing it and commenting on it. And I had only gotten like 10 likes on a status uh, up until that point you right, know i'd be like right. new profile pic like three likes <laughs> but with this you know people freaked out and so i it was the first time i had the idea there may be something here and then i started posting our text messages with her permission of course people ask me this all the time that's so funny i like tag her in the post people go what does your mother think <laughs> she loves it but she, um, loves it. she uh yes i started um posting these texts so to kind of see whether or not it was just this particular you know, right. fluke or whether or not there was something a little deeper there. And sure enough, they got all these, te you know, likes and I picked up followers and uh, I, I realized that it there really was something funny about her in a way that was it wasn't just funny to me because I always thought she was funny. But now I realize that, oh, wait, maybe other people think she's funny, too. And so it was that that kind of inspired the whole the whole saga, if you will. That is, so you started to keep track at some point of text messages, of any exchange you had with your mother, kind of to formulate this this book at some point, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, so journal entries as well. I know you used a lot of yeah. journal entries. So originally, th this actually may help kind of paint the picture. Originally, it was going to be kind of an Urban Outfitters coffee table book okay. where I just compiled the text messages and made it anecdotal. And I wrote, I, it's really funny because... Uh, Kevin Undergaro yes. had read the book proposal for that originally and oh, helped wow. me kind of construct that. Oh my gosh. Because I had no idea what I was doing. I had never written a book before. I didn't I... study creative writing other than screenwriting in college. It's just something I did on my own time very personally since I was a little kid. And um, long story short, I sent that proposal to different agents is how I met my current agent, Erin Malone, who is absolutely amazing. And she was the one who said that she loved this and she loved the concept and the voicing behind this and the characters. And if I could write a novel out of this kind of idea. And I said, absolutely, for whatever reason. And um, then, I, then I ran with that, which is why I start, it's kind of backwards. I started with texts and then had to build the story around them. Oh, so it's a, it's a little gosh. of an unconventional uh, way of going about writing a book. But the structure is, it, at least for me, it kept me, it kept me engaged because there's so many different variations. It's not, you know, just text, meaning just words. It's 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 text messages. It's police reports. It's right. <laughs> it's receipts. Um, so it's a real. I would say, if anything, it's a great book to um, for people who are busy too that have to keep right. putting it down and picking it up because it it just um, it has the the structure of something that um, you can just jump right back into and you don't have to find mm -hmm. the word. So I really I. Again, really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. Um, it's actually funny because I, I did a lot of research about the way we read now, especially oh, yeah? millennials and, and the fact that we, the way we have, it's not that people are reading less. It's a lot of the time people are reading differently than they ever have before, mm -hmm. where there's just kind of this onslaught of content. So you read a headline and Instagram and then, a, you know, a few words from, or, you know, a few paragraphs rather from an article. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to mimic that pace so that people stayed engaged in that way oh that's so interesting yeah it's like when we binge watch shows uh I, I was reading something about when we watch netflix millennials they watch it but they're checking their phones at the same time and their emails they're really doing like four or five things at once and they sure. don't really just watch tv yeah. it's one of five things that they're doing at once so this, this book fits right in uh, so when you decided to create the characters based off of your own life of course mm -hmm. you you did change the names and you kind of exaggerated the characters a bit yes. uh, so how <laughs> how much of our how much are you like Lou and how much is your mother like Shelley? It's interesting because I've, I've been saying this a lot recently. I think that me and Lou are the two most different characters in the book when it comes to the characters in the family. Like if you compare Val to my sister, or, you know, my mom right. to Shelley. Um, me and Lou are probably the most different where at our core, the things that we share are that we um, are definitely more on the nerdy side. <laughs> um, we share a certain um 
it's mostly mostly the dynamic between her and mom, right? So, you know, my mom was always super fun and over the top and right. telling me I should go out and party. And uh, I was always like, leave me alone. It's Friday night and I just want to binge watch my shows. Um, or I guess there wasn't even binge watching when I was in high school. Wow. Am I old now, I guess? No, but I thought about your mom being the mean girl's mom. Like, she, I'm a cool mom. It's funny. She, was, she called me once. Just She just sounded despondent. And she goes, Autumn, I realized something today. I said, what, mom? She goes, I, I'm at the dry bar and I'm watching the television and I realized I'm Amy Poehler and oh Mean Girls. God. No, she didn't. She did. That's amazing. So yes, you're, you're spot on. Oh my um, God. She's a much better mom than that. Okay, of okay, yes, yes. Of But you know, that, that general kind of, yes. she's the cool mom. She's the cool mom. And so, and Lou's kind of being the straight edge and being the person who's constantly keeping her in check. That is the way I am most like Lou. The original title of the book was Raising Mom. Because we had a completely flipped relationship. Absolutely. You're kind of like the parent. That's the sense I got in the book. Yes. Yeah. Um, that being said, we also share a love for philosophy and art history. Oh, okay. Which All is right. why I made her a uh, double major in philosophy and art history. Because I um, I picked two totally different useless majors, <laughs> which is theater and film. Not useless. I loved both of my majors. But, you know, <laughs> it's not, you know, business. Right, it's right, It's not right. what, you know, um, is encouraged normally. Right, of Follow course. your dreams. It's worth it. Well, when uh, you're in the land of dreams, you're fine. It's true. But um, I... Uh, I did make her major in philosophy and art history because those are two things I love. And if I could have picked two kind of more liberal arts educate, you know, liberal artsy subjects, those would have been my subjects. Now, Shelley and Mom, they are very similar <laughs> in the sense that they are fun. They are always trying. They they're very hip. And what I say by that is they're, they're very um, kind of timeless, and even though they're very much a product of, you know, right now, right. they are, um, they're ageless, if you will. They're, they grow up, but they don't grow old. And my mom is very much like that. And at, when I was younger, I never really appreciated it because it was just embarrassing. And it was just, uh, <laughs> you know, mom, leave me alone. But now what I realize is that there's a lot of wisdom in not taking life too seriously. And how when, and I tried to portray this in the book, when push comes to shove and you, she needs to act like the parent, she absolutely will. But she is a very big believer in letting the bad things roll off of your back and enjoying life to the fullest. Yes. So that, that's the way that they are the most, and their fashion sense. That is the way that they are the most uh, alike and their love for their daughters. Okay. And their overbearingness. <laughs> their over <laughs> Did you learn anything from Lou? Like from, oh. from creating her, is there anything that you learned about yourself from her? That's such an interesting question. Um, yes, actually. There was a lot. I, I learned a lot through writing this book in general, but from Lou specifically, um, I learned a lot about... This is going to sound funny, but let me, let me ex explain. I'm not I, judging. I learned a lot about millennial entitlement. And the reason I, I did was I, when I was constructing Lou as a character, obviously it came a lot from my worst moments where like the moments where I said, I'm going to write my resume today. And then I just like, it's 6 PM and I've done nothing but watch YouTube videos and like have eaten like a pint of ice cream and a bag of skinny pop. Where am I? Um, and, and I wanted anyone who has ever done that or felt that to relate to that kind of struggle of feeling lost, especially right after college. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was interesting to kind of see the way, when I was interviewing a lot of my friends who moved back in from college and getting kind of their insights, I learned two things. One, why people believe that millennials are entitled. And two, why millennials are actually amazing and some of the most like uh, ambitious people I know. Uh, in terms of what I learned about myself, I would say I learned that I am, uh, I need to, I need to appreciate my mom more, <laughs> if that makes sense. Really? Uh, yeah, I definitely learned that um, I can be, a li it's not, I'm never hard on my mom. My mom and I have a great relationship, but in the, if I was the parent, it made me really appreciate her fun loving spirit even more. That's beautiful though, that you got to experience that and kind of learn something from, from something that originally wasn't going to be exactly like you but then you ended up somehow connecting oh sure and, and i mean i still wish she'd take the gps off my phone yeah but oh my <laughs> gosh find my friends yes I, the fact that she knows how to do that is another story and that's amazing and that's in the book you got to read that guy <laughs> um, but what did you learn about millennial entitlement what was the most um, um surprising or interesting thing oh i think that it was the thing that i found most interesting was 
it's a stereotype, right? That millennials just think that they should be, you know, mm-hmm. running the show right away. And I think that is true and not true at the same time where the, the truth behind it is I know a lot of people who graduated and it's not that they're not really ambitious and intelligent and thoughtful people. It's that they have really excelled their whole life. And they go to colleges like Columbia or Yale or even, you know, if it's not an Ivy League, they go to, you know, the best college in their area. And they and then they realize that to to excel and they, they it's like a step back. It's almost like a it, it's it hurts to not suddenly not be first in class. And it's not that everything was given to them. It's that they worked really, really hard to kind of be in this, you know, if you're a big fish in a small pond and then suddenly. Exactly. You yeah. know, uh, continue. So I kind of go back and forth where I have seen a lot of people in my age demographic who graduate college and go like, I should be running the show or I don't want to have to actually, you know, be the intern getting coffee. But then I know so many people who are the interns getting coffee and they are, their aspirations are so great Mm -hmm. and their feelings about it are I've seen that my parents aren't necessarily happy in their jobs and I want a job in my life that is fulfilling emotionally and uh spiritually and and economically and maybe that is too much to ask I don't know yet um I'm 24 but I I do I see the idealism in that and I think it's I think it's beautiful yeah it's interesting to think about millennials in general, and because we are millennials, so we're a little bit biased. But yeah, totally. I mean, can I, there's a lot about you will definitely open your eyes to yourself if you read this book, because there's <laughs> a lot of eye-opening experiences. Um, I want to jump to one of the um, pages here that I wanted to share and ask you about. Um, sure. So <laughs> there is a text exchange between um, Mama Shell and yourself, and <laughs> she says. Are you coming with us to Temple on Monday? Let's roll in looking hot as shit. We'll get our hair done and wear cute little dresses. It'll be fun. And Lou says, Mom, I think you might be missing the point of Temple. So I feel like there's a lot, at least for me, I don't know, this was, your mom and my mom are the same person in so many ways. (laughs) So maybe I'd love to meet your mom. I mean, yeah, she's (laughs) hilarious and she's just like your mom in so many ways. And there's so many times that I've felt like I was the parent to my mom. And um, sharing this book, just, I was telling you off the air, I was sharing this, um, some of the um, text exchanges with some of my friends that I was like, you have to read this book, it's hilarious. And all of them said the same thing. My mom's exactly the same. Or my mom will tell me to dress up for something that's like, this is a moment of like, you don't need to be dressed up for, or your nails done. And there's so many circumstances in this book. Uh, Now, are those based off of real moments with your mother, the temple moment? That actually is a real life quote from my mother. Oh, it is, amazing. That one is a real one. I love it. Um, Not, most of them are not, but that is a real one. And um, (laughs) I'll never forget that in my life. But she, uh, the thing about my mom that's amazing, and obviously, it's true she's my best friend and she's cool and what i love about the women in my life who are of her age demographic yeah um are that they are you know in their 50s sorry mom to betray you but you know they're in their 50s (laughs) 21 yeah exactly we're the same age it's very strange (laughs) it's very weird um no but but all that joking aside what's wonderful is that they are women proudly in their 50s my mom has never actually lied about her age and they are fun and they get dressed up and they wear heels and even if I think it's totally ridiculous <laughs> like oh why do I have to put makeup and like socks on I'm going to you know yeah. pick up the mail right, right um there there's a there's a pride and an excitement and they put their you know red pumps on and they go out and even though their kids are no it's that weird in between stage it's the empty nester thing right it is and yeah. it's nice to think in a in a culture that is so obsessed with youth to see a bunch of women to aspire to. It's not that, you know, well, you're going to hit your 50s and then you're going to go through a... It's not all American beauty. Right. It's, you know, there there are really amazing, fun-loving women who are, you know, not 20 anymore, but also they're not knitting and playing bridge. Not that there's anything wrong with either there's of those things. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's no. definitely going to be me in like three years. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's, let's be honest, I play mahjong. I have to say, I feel like a lot of millennials were like grandmas. I, I don't know what it is. We None of us go out. We no. all stay home. It's unbelievable. Uh, but... I want to go into, so for people that may be saying to themselves, but, you know, maybe they don't have a mom or maybe they don't sure. have that ability to relate for whatever reason, um, your dad is very much in this book too. So let's just, <laughs> your dad, the daughter-dad relationship is awesome. Aww. And um, 
there is a, a couple of rules that he had. So so the Lou, the character that mm -hmm. is based off of you, comes back after college, moves in with her parents, and she creates a list of like expectations and what she needs to make sure she lives at home. But your dad also has that going on mm -hmm. too. Um, he says there'll be no technical curfew, but if I come home after midnight, this, these are rules that you gave your dad. There will be no technical curfew, but if I come home after midnight, the pugs will bark like crazy. So my unofficial curfew is midnight. Oh, these yeah, these are the ones that he gives her. He he gives her dad's yes. rules, expectations. Yeah, okay. The first person awake makes the coffee. If I ever tell mom about his late night snacking, he's cutting me off. So yeah, you wrote about his expectations, and those are the three of them that are there. And it was interesting that you that you added him to that. So. Is his character at all based off of your dad? Like, is are there more similarities between them? Oh, totally. Than right. maybe your mother and Shelly, or would you say it's equal on both ends? I would say what's kind of interesting because I would say actually my dad is really close to Charlie. Um, he is the salt of the earth, and the thing that I loved about I, I like to think of them as like a modern day Lucy and Ricky, where he she is Speaking high language. in the sky and so fun and airy, and he is the salt of the earth and constantly reeling her in, um, but appreciates her and loves her for who she is, and he um, the the similarities between my dad and Charlie in the book are that they are. Um, they are grounded people and they can be, you know, he can be tough loving, but then he can also be so tender and so, you know, sweet when you actually need him there. And his uh, his kind of gruff exterior, but ultimate love for his uh, the women in his life. Right. Those are definitely the parallels. But, you know, your dad is very, obviously, extremely creative um, mm -hmm. and um, very successful. So when you were writing his character and basing it off of him, did you go to him for any creative input or did you bounce ideas off of him? You know, my parents read every chapter of the book as I was writing it. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah, my mom loved it. Every day she'd come in, she goes, do you have a new chapter for oh, me? So she loved it. Okay. And I was like, my like... hair was like in every direction. I was in my pajamas, like looking like Gollum. I'm like, go away, it's not done. Um, but yeah, I, I did actually, because it was interesting. I came to him for help creatively, but never specifically notes about the book. He would give them to me if he had any. Okay. Um, I didn't even ask for them. But he would just go, this is what I think. Oh my God. But he can't help himself. But um, with creativity in general, I, I at one point had to like delete 30, 40 pages in the middle of writing. It was devastating. I came to him and I was sobbing. Or I just like had tears streaming down my face. I was kind of like stoic about it. And um, like, Dad, I have to get rid of it. It's not working. <sighs> and he goes, such is, a, such is the life of an artist, Autumn. And he just sat there and we talked about the creative process and, oh you know, how you, see, you have to kill your darlings. And uh, so, yeah, he was very much a help for me in the creativity realm, but not necessarily in the, uh, I think that you should, you know, go shopping at Barney's here. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> did you, when you first decided to write it, did you tell your mom or your dad first? Oh, man. Let me think. I think it was pretty. It was definitely my mom. You did okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty instantaneous. Whatever but, she knows, he knows immediately. Okay, got but it. Okay. Most of these things I tell my mom first. Um, when I got out of the uh, the meeting with my agent, I called her and I said because I had gone thinking I was going to get advice, and I call her from the bathroom and I go, I think she's signing me. <gasps> And oh, she was amazing. on the tarmac. I'm remembering this as I'm telling you this. And I, she was on the tarmac at JFK with one of her good friends um, who, uh, her name is Elise Walker, who's amazing. And they uh, were going to like fashion week or something. I don't remember. And she starts screaming on the, uh, on the <laughs> oh, airplane. Oh my God. So That's amazing. It's amazing that they took off. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What so an amazing memory. Her. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, the like what your hopes are for people that are that are going to read this or that are thinking of reading it what are your hopes what do you hope that they that they get out of it that they can take away from it wow i hope i well i i've been telling you this before i said that if if i make you laugh out loud and call your mom i've succeeded yeah. in every possible yeah. way yeah to me if you pick up this book my my sincerest hope is that it makes you smile Honestly, it's as simple as that. That would I like for you to see the satirical elements? Absolutely. There are definitely layers to it, and that I hope that you get the dark senses of humor that comes out throughout, or maybe you catch some of the millennial entitlement, or maybe you catch some of the millennial love, which I throw a lot in there. 
Um, and for my best friends, I hope that you catch the myriad uh, Easter <laughs> eggs that I threw in there for you. Oh my gosh. But for just generally speaking, what I really hope is that if you pick up this book, it makes you smile and it makes you forget about whatever worries you have in the immediate future. That it, it's kind of an escape. And it makes you think about it makes you think about the people that are closest to you in your life and whether you can relate to their particular lifestyle, um, which is kind of very uh, unique or not. I hope that you can relate to that kind of mother-daughter dynamic and relationship where they drive us crazy and they're way on too on top of us. And sometimes they make no sense to us at all, but we love them more than anything. It's a great takeaway. <laughs> so Okay, so I have to say, when I was reading this, the one thing that kept popping in my head is seeing this as a TV series. And I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but I have to ask because I see it so clearly. I feel like you are, like you're, you're the voice of of our time. You're like the Lena oh Dunham, God. but for, <laughs> for books, really. And um, would you ever be interested in in creating this into a series or making this into a series? Oh my God! Or I, even a movie. When I first started writing it, my mom burst into my room and said, "Who's playing me?" Oh gosh, who is playing her? Oh my goodness, she has a list of demands. The casting director oh. is like, "No work Wait, on no this." No way. Yeah, she's like, "It's gonna be Reese. No, it's gonna be Shh. Meryl. No, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be, uh, oh my goodness, uh, who's the rec <laughs> most recent one?" Um, there, there were so she's gone she's through pretty up. much every okay. like okay. you know amazing blonde in Hollywood <laughs> okay, right now. Okay, perfect. I love but um, she, I would love to see this as a television you series. Would. I would okay. love to. I mean, it's I grew up in f uh, film and television. I studied screenwriting. Of course. And these are character characters who I think lend themselves to the screen because they are larger than life and they are um they're a they're a fun world to inhabit. So yes, the answer is I would love to see that happen. Fingers crossed. Would you play yourself? I hope. You would I'm love to play yourself. I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And for your dad, do you think that he would want to play himself? I don't know if he's available for me. <laughs> right, but, right, right. You know, he. Uh, I would definitely. I would definitely come to him with a, with a. You know. A good offer. I would have right. to, you know, come with them with a good offer. Nothing would make me happier than to work with my dad again. Now, I know it's a little soon, but are you thinking about writing something else? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you are? You already oh, in plans yes. it? I've been, I've been writing a lot. Um, you know, a lot's going to be determined in the next two weeks because we're going to see how this book does right. to see how, what path this story takes and yeah. whether or not there's a sequel or a TV show or what have you. But in terms of other stuff writing, yeah, I've already started writing like two different television shows. Um, yeah, it never stops. You can ask any writer. The minute you close one book, literally, you're already on to the next one. And I want to know, last question, regarding millennials and advice you could offer, because you're one of the very successful millennials who are oh, doing us well. You. Thank you. Uh, what piece of advice could you give for, for millennials that are struggling to figure out their path or they're uh, procrastinating a lot or doing one of the many <laughs> millennial things that we are guilty of doing? What's some advice you could offer? Um, I would say, first and foremost, do not believe the millennial hate. <laughs> and I mean that because I used to be like, oh, I don't get my job. Yes, I do. I am a... Yeah deep product of my generation and I'm so so proud of it. Um, every generation before believes that the generation under them is going to completely destroy everything. And yep. It's a tale as old as time. They go, oh they're self-centered and shallow. It's, yeah because they're children. Right. All children are a little self-centered. That's right. the nature of the beast. Um, there are ancient Greek quotes about it but so first and foremost don't believe the millennial hate. You're awesome. <laughs> and um, second and kind of piggybacking off of that I feel weird giving advice to anyone at this juncture um, but I know for my own self, if there's something I needed to hear, it's that don't let anyone, because you are young, or I mean, the older, older millennials are 35 now, mm -hmm. so, you know, still young, but yes. really firmly in the workplace, um, don't let anyone negate what you are capable of by putting that title on you. They're like, oh, you're a millennial, and therefore somehow you mm -hmm. are lesser than. That's absolute bull. That right. is not true at all. We right. are some of the most highly educated people in the world, some of the most ambitious. There's no reason to assume that your generation is exactly. the one screwing everything up. It's no, not. No, we are all snowflakes. Individual, yes. unique snowflakes. Yes, and if you look from a distance, we all look the same, let's be honest. <laughs> but if you get close, if you get close, it's beautiful. I love it. Thank you. So, is there anything else you wanted to share before we before um, we ended, happy birthday, mom! Yes, happy birthday! I hope you have an amazing birthday. Twenty first birthday. Yeah. Happy yes. twenty five, mom! <laughs> Beautiful as always. And again, where can people pick up your book? Yes, you can pick it up at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, Target, pretty much anywhere books are sold. I encourage you to go to your local bookstore. You that are my favorite places in the world. Yes, yes, they still exist, people. Millennials, 
They yes. still exist. Go run to them. <laughs> run to them, yes. But audiobook is available too. Yes, uh, audiobook is available. And where can everybody find you on social media? Yes, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram at Autumn Chicklis. I also have a Facebook page. I'm trying to post a lot right now. So, uh, <laughs> Ask me questions, keep me engaged. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm Ashley Daniels. You can find me on Instagram at Miss Ashley Daniels and Twitter at Ashley Daniels. This is another Spotlight On. Thank you so much for joining. We'll see you next time. From executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.